G'day team, welcome back to the My Mate Podcast and I'm very excited for this week's episode because we have a very special guest on the show and I've been following his work for quite a while and I hope I pronounce his name right, Stefanos Sifanos and uh, he's an Australian gentleman. He lives in the US and he's actually going to be buying a house uh, in Austin where he, he'll end up doing a lot of his work for 2020 Um at the end of the year, so so that'll be really exciting. But I've been following his work for quite a while because obviously I'm very very much interested in male health, um, mental and physical health, holistic health, um, psychology and, and spirituality. And Steph is uh, is in his own world with that, so he's very much an inspiration for me. He's been doing this for years, and he and he kind of merges the Eastern and Western, <coughs> excuse me, methodologies um, to promote balance and, and and union and 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 love and. You know all these important things that I that I really believe that we kind of have lost in this day and age. Um, his own journey is quite is quite interesting, and we really had a deep insight, um, which was which was, was very humbling. And uh, throughout the show, and he kind of he started off in life, you know, in an abusive household, and he developed these subconscious coping strategies and, and defense mechanisms, which he didn't actually see at the time, but you know. He, he, he moved in and out, I believe it was one relationship that kind of sparked him to, to really have a, a deep look and he went into all different sorts of um, self-awareness cultivation techniques and what came of it is essentially the, um, the, the brand and the business that is Steph today and he's, he's, he's worked with Olympic gold medalists, world champions, all different sorts of individuals, um, you know, fighters. And uh, he, he's got quite an interesting story, but I think the best thing about him is that he speaks very practically um, with otherwise very deep topics. Like we're talking about ego identity. We're talking about how identity can change and what spiritual practices have taught us over the years. We're talking about masculinity, femu- femininity, and he has a very practical approach, which means that we can really follow along and just kind of get what he says. Um, so... It's a really brilliant podcast, guys. I really hope you enjoy it, and uh, I'll speak to you after the episode. Bye. Oh, mate, thanks so much for doing the show. Yeah, of course. Of course. Yeah, I've been following your stuff um, for a while now, actually, and I, I, I really wanted to get a chance to chat to you, um, specifically with your stuff around ego transformation. I think that's like a, it's a really deep topic. Um, that that is a really important topic, you know. Just just essentially yeah. the the idea that identity is malleable, um, that you, you can change, and that yeah. also change is very difficult and requires um, a serious amount of effort, you know. But it's so important. Yeah, yeah. I think I think with um, I think with change and transformation, man, there needs to be a willingness and a recognition that we want to shift from one state to another. That we. We, we feel that we're in an undesirable state of being and expression in the world for whatever reason and that we want to move into a more desirable state. And that's really directed and driven by our values. It's directed and driven by who we are, what we're experiencing, what we want to gravitate towards and move towards. And so recognising that as a starting point is very important. Mm. And then, you know, having the willingness and willing to put in the effort, willing to move through some pain and difficulty and challenge around that because transformation can be. Um, you know, being willing to also explore letting go of what no longer serves us and explore, okay, what is this, what is this being that I want to step into? And when you're talking about ego, you know, there are many ways to understand ego. And one of the ways, especially contextually with respect to what we're speaking to, ego is that part of us that, or parts of us that are really attached to familiarity and attached to what is known and so anything that is unfamiliar or unknown is considered unsafe and if it's unsafe and unfamiliar it's not comfortable why gravitate towards something that we know nothing about Mm. and the the way the ego justifies it and it's a protective mechanism and a protective mask sometimes and we'll hear it in our own internal chatter. Oh, why do you want to make those changes? You're not good enough or you're not smart enough or you're not able enough. Or why, you know, what we're doing now works. We have food on our table. We have a steady income. You know, why do you want to try that new job? Why do you want to go out in your own business? Or why do you want to ask that girl out? What, what rejection is no good. That's not a healthy thing. Why would you want to do that? Just stay where you are. You're comfortable. You're, you're happy. You're, you've got, you know, the, the, the sun is shining. And so we start to justify. 
right? And those mm. voices is really the ego finding a way using more negative tone, tonality to, to protect us and keep us safe. And in those moments, we, we have to have a different conversation with ourselves. We have to move away from non-judgment. We have to sort of step out of fear a little bit, but at the same time, step into the fear and say, well, what else do you really want to tell me? And you give that fear a voice. And in giving it a voice, you almost, we almost defuse it. And, and it gives us, it creates spaciousness in our minds to think laterally and be more creative and also give us more confidence to step into parts of the unknown. And so part of that could be, okay, let's step into the unknown, but maybe let's take some baby steps. Let's not, let's not take massive leaps, but maybe let's take some baby steps. And it's slow exposure. And in the realm of neuroscience, we're talking about pendulation and titration where we're slowly exposing ourselves to something new which becomes palatable, right? It becomes, it becomes doable, more doable for us. So then we get an experience, then you get to have a conversation with those parts of you that are highly protective. And the conversation mm. may be, see, we just did that. We did something new and different. It felt really good and we didn't die. Well, what if we go to the next thing? So the ego will still be resistant, but it maybe might be less resistant or at least you have, or parts of us, when I say you, I mean the, the parts of us that are wanting to step into change have a clearer line of communication and an enhanced sense of confidence and, and, and self-awareness and self-worth to actually make those, those leaps. Mm. And sometimes we feel like we're you know, almost schizophrenic and we're going through, we've got all these voices in our heads, but the truth is it's just the, the different parts of ourselves negotiating how to handle reality. Mm. And the psyche is, um, it's, it's fragmented in that way per se, um, but it doesn't necessarily need to be fractured. And so we can have the, all these different parts working together if we start to pay attention to these different parts of ourselves and these voices instead of suppressing them and numbing them, she giving them a healthy outlet and having that internal conversation. Yes, that makes so much sense. Um, and when you spoke about, you know, changing and, and taking little baby steps into the unknown and, and all that sort of thing, and it made me think of, what you, what you said at the beginning where it's like, why would you want to change? You know, you're happy. You've got a roof over your head, food on the table. Mm. Uh, most of the, the people that you work with or just people mm. in general that are into this sort of stuff, is it kind of like they get to a place where it's, it's yes, changing is hard and stepping into the unknown is, is, is hard, but not changing given the, the fact of where they are is just way harder. Like it's almost like they're at this tipping point where they're suffering so much that they, they, mm. they can't see any other light and they have to, to make a change. Yeah. It's not that staying where we are is, is more difficult. It's, it's, um, it's sorry. That is staying where we are is actually easier. It's more painful, but we're addicted to the pain because it's familiar. Mm. That's mm. the essence of it. And so we're, because we're so familiar and accustomed to the pain, we're attached to it because we associate our expression in the world or our ability to just live. Um, a big part of that is attached to that pain. And so we don't want to let the pain go. And, I, and I've spoken to this before. It's interesting because let me see if I can break it down in more simple terms, but also make some connections. So when we experience, so most of who we are as adults is formed during our developmental years. And there's, there's various um, important phases and stages of our development. And we can even call them critical stages or subcritical stages of our development. But there's two critical stages or ages, age ranges. So from zero to seven and then from, you know, sort of seven to 12, eight to 12, eight to 13 maybe, um, where so much of us is formed. And so there's, there's, there's um, subcategories of that, subcritical stages of formation and developmental um, staging through those two periods. And much of who we are is formed through that, um, those stages there, through those periods. Now, we bring those coping strategies and we bring those ways of seeing the world, our belief systems, our models of reality, how we give and receive love, what we think about ourselves, how we feel about ourselves, how we judge others, how we deal with conflict, how we, what makes us happy, what we value, what's important to us, what we're attracted to, what we're interested in, our sexuality, and the list goes on, right? Mm. We bring that into our adult lives and our adult relationships and our adult endeavours. If that, those areas of life 
are left unchecked. In other words, if we don't reflect on why we do what we do, if we don't reflect on our thoughts, our actions, our internal behaviors, belief systems, etc., and our external behaviors, our expressions in the world, our personality types, who we're attracting, type of people, how we argue, um, et cetera, et cetera. If we leave all that unchecked, we just keep repeating the same patterns from our developmental years. And we sort of get stuck and when we experience pain and difficulty, we don't know why, but, but we just get frustrated. But we, we then usually have very similar experiences with different people with different situations, right? Mm. So when you're talking about change, we're speaking to these coping strategies that we develop as young children to deal with our pain and difficulty. And these are psychological, psycho-emotional coping strategies and they help us deal with the difficulty at hand. Now, at that time, they can be really useful. And I'll give you an example in a moment. At that time, they can be really useful. But as adults, they may not really serve us because they're perpetuating not only a coping strategy that doesn't work as an adult, but also a pain that is being amplified by a similar situation that we're experiencing as adults that really doesn't warrant that level of coping strategy to come in place, which actually pushes people away, distances us, and keeps us stuck in the past. Are you following me so far? Yes, yes. Cool. Okay. Yep. So yep. what happens is we're more addicted to the coping strategies that deal with the pain. Now, the coping strategy doesn't exist without the pain, so we keep playing the pain over in our adult lives, which makes the change more difficult, right? And so the coping strategy says to us, ah, oh, we're capable, we're able, we're worthy. I feel better. Mm. So we're addicted to the feeling better after the feeling really bad. Now, an example of that is as a kid, if you grew up in an environment that was very abusive, very volatile, very violent, I, I did as an example, one of the coping strategies I used when I was a younger kid, so three, four years old, two years old, five years old, was um, try not to be seen and try not to be heard. In other words, make everybody else happy and sacrifice my needs. Because if I can make everybody else happy, chances are the environment's not going to be as violent or as volatile. Yes. And so that was one of the coping strategies I would bring up as an adult. And so I would live in the shadows. I would make other people happy, but mate, I would be upset or I wouldn't be content or I wouldn't be satisfying my own needs and I wouldn't be following my truth. And one of the coping strategies I developed as a teenager, as a, as a, a later kid, was being very aggressive in the world. So I started, I went the opposite way. So I went on this spectrum. And so what would happen as an adult is because I was so frustrated as a kid about hiding from the world and being bullied and everything else that I, I then lashed out. I found my courage, but in an extreme way and lashed out. And as an adult, I would still have this pattern of people pleasing, but then I would be so upset and frustrated that then I would then lash out as well. Right. And so it was so fucking confusing, but guess what? My childhood was confusing. Yes. So yes. I was just reenacting confusion in my adult relationships because it was familiar because yes. I didn't want to change no matter even though the change was even though the circumstances were so painful I didn't want to change them because it's all I knew mm. and I was addicted to the coping strategies of feeling better and having the release it's like when you're I'm like, when you're about to sneeze or you really you really got to go to the toilet and you're holding in your urine and then when you go there's like oh release <laughs> when you sneeze there's this massive release and you feel better you feel empty and so for men, the sense of emptiness is very important because it's one of our primary driving forces is a masculine energy. But, be, it, but take away masculine and feminine dynamics just for a moment. Mm. Um, that, that sense of release is what we're addicted to because it feels so good. But the release doesn't occur because we live in a, a world of duality. The release doesn't occur without the opposite of that, the which build is up. the pain, right. the build up, right. Right? and the challenge. Yes. Jeez. Jeez, there's a, there's a lot of questions. That's that's really that's really powerful. Um, yeah, because I was going to ask, like, why you know why because you know specific sorts of people get into this line of work. Um, and I was going to ask about that sort of stuff, and you kind of made mention um, of the childhood. I'd be very interested to hear about your experience as well, um, moving through that process of change and um, ego mm -hmm. transformation. Talk us through that. Like, when did you begin to start to realize that there were some subconscious coping strategies there? And, and what was the process like of, of deconditioning the, your, your past? Mm. Mm. I knew from a young age because I was exposed to 
deeper practices of self-awareness. However, I wasn't really taking meaningful action on it because I was too entrenched in my behavior and in my patterns. And it was too scary for me to change. And I preferred being more control. Being aggressive was me being in control. And so that felt safer. I felt so out of control as a kid that I wanted to feel safe as an adult. And so mm. I did whatever I needed to do to feel safe. And realistically, I didn't make that commitment to change deeply until about probably, even though I'd been doing a lot of awareness work, I wasn't integrated. I wasn't embodied. Um, I, I knew a lot intellectually and even could feel emotionally, but they were disconnected and they right. weren't matched. And I wasn't, I wasn't making the connections I needed to make because I didn't want to. Mm. The big, biggest parts of me didn't want to. The ego self, that the protective part of me, well, that voice was very loud. And so maybe six, seven years ago, I, I decided to, to sort of go deeper into that and not sort of, I did, I went very deep into that. I had a breakup. I was unfaithful in that relationship. Um, it brought up a lot of stuff from my childhood. I, start, I, I, I delved into shame, immense amount of shame and guilt and remorse, but the shame was very intense. And watching what I did to my partner at the time, watching her and observing the pain that she went through and brought up a lot of my childhood stuff. And I started projecting my, my little boy into her and what, what, what did I do in the actions that I was taking? And why was I behaving that way? Why was I hiding? Why was I in shadows? And why was I so aggressive? And why was I so, I was never physically or, or sexually uh, abusive to any, any of my partners. But it was emotional abuse and it was hiding. I was hiding myself. I was yeah. living in shadow and I was unfaithful, immensely unfaithful. And I was just doing my own thing without taking account for anyone. I was living a very selfish life from a place of protection and wanting to feel safe. Because the more I gave to me, because again, I was a people pleaser. I was a caretaker. I had that caretaking savior archetype. And so the more I ended up giving to me, the more... I felt better, but I couldn't do that in, in the open. I was doing it in the shadows because I still had this attachment of people pleasing and making people happy. Right. And so I was very confused. And so until I really looked into that, and I did everything, man. I, I gave up my businesses. I went into debt. I, I mean, I nearly went bankrupt. Um, I, I went all in on my personal development and growth. I went to counselors, psychologists. I was spending thousands of dollars a week. Um, uh, I was doing my own internal practices of solitude engaged in breath work, shamanic practice, energy healers, spiritual healers. Um, I was reading, I was meditating, I was in nature, I was moving my body. Everything I was doing was very intentful, intentional, very clear. And I just started delving into my shadows and into my pain bodies and into the reasons why I was being who I was being, which wasn't really aligned with what I was speaking to the world and what I had vision for myself. Mm. Um, and I just went all in, man. And I, and I, I said to myself, I re remember very distinctly saying this to myself. I was in my lounge at the time. I was sitting down. I had tears rolling down my face. And I said, I'm, I'm going all in on this. If it kills me, if I have to commit suicide, if I end up in a mental asylum, if I lose everything that I know to be me, if I lose my friends, if I lose everything that's important, I don't care. I'm going all in on this because whatever's on the other side, it needs to be better than living this life of fakeness yes and i went all in man and and once i made once i was willing to do that i like really really willing to do that my whole life changed now it's that's not to say that it wasn't painful it was immensely painful and it nearly killed me suicide was the norm for me you know feeling suicidal was the norm for me for for a period of time and i also knew i was destined for more than just that and so i persevered i persisted there was resistance I had support. I also chose for the first time in my life to really go in alone a lot. Um, not to be lonely, but to be in solitude, to be with my own self, to not run away from these feelings and these thoughts that I've been having for so long and these demons that were in me. I thought that were demons. They were just confused voices that were part of me. And I started integrating all these aspects of my psyche. Mm. You know, I, I engaged in gestalt therapy and family constellation work. I did generational healing. I spent time with elders. Man, I, I went, I went in a yeah. couple of years. Yeah, yeah. Fuck, I love that, man. That there's, yeah. there's two points specifically that I really loved about that. Um, the one you literally just said, engaging in elders. You know, like wisdom of the past is, is such a powerful yeah. tool that I think. Um, I don't know. I don't know if whether it's just like my own interpretive structure is failing to see that in the world today. But you know. Like even if I just sit down with my grandma, right, and she starts telling me about her life, I'm just I'm 
yeah. I'm blown away. And then it just reminds yeah. me about all these things that I tend to miss and what's really important. Um, but the, the thing that I'd love for you to respond on was you kept mentioning that you're going in these states of awareness and I think a lot of people are open to that, you know, trying to see themselves from a more, well, I hope so. <laughs> more people are um, open to seeing themselves from a more objective lens. Um, but the, the second half of that, which is probably more important, is the integration phase. It's like applying that awareness into your life to actually create the change. Um, so I'd love for you to speak on that and what that was like for you, um, integrating the change of the stuff that you'd learnt. Yeah, you know, brother, I, I don't think that ever stops. I don't think awareness stops. I don't think integration stops. I, I'm consistently becoming more and more aware of the minutiae of my behaviour and my internal uh, mindset and emotional being uh, and spiritual self, and I'm more attentive than ever to how I behave in the world, and I'm still integrating in different respects. You know, mm. I just feel a lot of the core wounding that I experienced as a child, I've really dealt with. And that's not to say that layers of that don't keep coming up mm -hmm. and revealing themselves for me to work through and, and up level and move into the next phase of my own existence. However, the integration piece was very, it was very difficult because there was a lot of doubt around, well, am I always going to be unfaithful? Am I always just going to be out of control? Do I have a, a love compulsion? Do I have a sex addiction? Do I? So I explored all of these. And it was with great challenge. And, but with time, with practice, with patience, with diligence, with focus, with being very in, in, intentional with my actions, I started to see a new version of me. And I started to feel different. I started to trust myself. I did a lot of work around self-worth and self-value. And that really helped integrate me at a deeper level. And honestly, brother, I would just be getting feedback from strangers and even people that were very close to me saying, Steph, you're different. You, mm -hmm. you feel more embodied and integrated. It feels like you're actually walking your talk. And I was for the first time in my life. So it was very evident, you know. I was very good at talking and, and saying all these wonderful things, but I wasn't successful in anything I was doing. I wasn't making real ripples and impact because I wasn't integrated. And the moment I became integrated, I, I started making more impact. I started feeling differently about myself. I could go to bed without guilt and shame. You know, I could wake up in the morning without guilt and shame. You know, and that was a big thing. And I didn't have to deny that or suppress that anymore because it wasn't there to suppress. Yes. It wasn't there to numb. So I became less extreme in my behavior. I started noticing these things as well. I was more balanced. I still have an have a extremist personality and that still plays out in my life. But again, the come from and the reasons for that are different now as well. And I'm more balanced. I'm definitely more balanced. Yeah. In, yeah. You know, in how I do life, whether it's the, my athletic endeavors, whether it's how I love, whether it's how I give and receive, um, whether it's how I create in the world, you know, whatever it is, creating content, creating partnerships, businesses, um, how I, you know, do I still have elements of people pleasing and savior archetypes? Absolutely. I still have elements of that in me. However, I can notice them. I can notice when I'm over pleasing and I can quickly, quickly rectify it. Whereas before I wasn't, wasn't like that. I don't know, will that stuff ever go away? I mean, maybe, maybe not. If it doesn't go away, does that mean we're not fully integrated? I don't believe that. I, I think maybe there's just more to learn in that space. I think if we're alive, our eyes are open, our hearts are beating and we're walking through the world, I think we're constantly going to be integrating and growing. I think that's part of this human experience. And, and we do that until we physically die. And I think that's part of when we're talking about karmic accumulation, I think that's part of it. Whether you believe in, in multiple lives or not, we're talking about creating harmony and balance in our world. And I think we do that through the taking of action. It's through reflection and action, reflection and action, internal, external, internal, external, and vice versa. And our ability to take action is, a, is an opportunity to, to shift and change our internal paradigms. And so unless we're completely enlightened where we have the capacity to disappear, yeah. you know, from this earth plane, then I think we're constantly going to be growing and learning. Yes. It, and, and that was the next thing um, I was going to ask you was because, you know, you, you get in, this was true for my own experience as well. Um, and uh, my, my other half's a um, breathwork meditation teacher. I think we were speaking about that, but um, yeah. you know, you, you get in, you get really interested in this awareness um, cultivation, you know, you're like, Oh my yeah. God, I'm so much deeper than I thought. And that experience when I was four really genuinely changed me. And I didn't know why. And it's almost like your identity becomes someone who is just continually trying to chase the awareness. 
And yes. you, you reminded me of something you said then when you were like, you know, oh, does this ever stop? And it's, it's kind of like, well, well, no, it doesn't. But at the same time, you don't just want to be the person that's like, oh, I want to keep digging to be perfect. It's like, I'm kind of going to be like that, you know? Correct. Yeah. I really resonate with that. And now, so at the stage of, I'm life, of life that I'm at, at the moment is that I'm, I'm, I'm sitting back and I'm observing and I'm not chasing or actively massively pursuing. Sometimes I am, but right mm. now I'm just observing. So, okay, so something's come up there. It doesn't quite feel in alignment with who I am. Um, let me observe that. Now mm. let me build some awareness around that, you know? And so it's not being in that. I think we're perpetual students. I think that's important to assume that, that role. And there are times where we're not learning and we're teaching and we're actually, the paradox is when we're teaching, we're learning anyway. When we're yes. learning, we're teaching, you know? Um, and, and so, you know, by, by being active and being uh, intentful in our listening and our willing to learn, the teacher by default gets to learn something about themselves because they have a student that's learning. And, and so whether that's through digital media, whether that's in person, it's irrelevant. I mean, uh, if you're doing a, a live video or a video, you can't physically see the other people, but you're, you're doing that video with an intent to share information, mm. serve, be of, be of service, help other people. And so by default, you're learning as well. And so there's a, there's a paradox there, but I hear what you're saying. Sometimes we have those people, and I was this person where we're excessively wanting to learn and we're excessively in this, what's the next personal development course? Oh, Tony Robbins. I've done Tony Robbins now. I can do Martini. I've done Martini. Maybe I can do someone else. And what's the next retreat? What's the next immersion? What's yeah. the whole plant medicine? I'll, I'll go do, um, I'm going to do ayahuasca 15 weeks in a row. And, <laughs> yeah, you know, right. it's like... <laughs> just become like, a plant. <laughs> yeah, basically just calm the fuck down yeah, and integrate yeah. what, what we're learning, you know, and that's really important. And, and that's, and again, these are lessons I've learned the hard way or yeah. the difficult way. However, I've learned, and that's my, that's my experience and my truth. It's also extremes. And so I, what I've seen and what I've observed in life is that we don't do too well in extremes. We, mm. don't, we don't flourish and thrive in extremes. We can survive but we don't thrive in extremes, consistent extremes. Sometimes we have to be extremes for certain situations, such as if your life's at risk or, you know, if you have a deadline or with something that's really important to you, you've got to produce a piece of maybe a white paper or something or a document or uh, something for work and, and work's important to you. It's more than just work, it's your service and you've got to stay up all night and that's a bit extreme, you know, you're not sleeping. In moderation, sure, but then again, at a macro level, it's moderate, you're mm -hmm. in balance consistent extremity is not healthy. And I think we see that in stay awake for 12 days. Don't eat for, don't eat for 50 days. You know, you don't drink water. That's these extreme. It's not sustainable. Mm. You know, constantly be arguing with people in your life that you care about. Um, you're going to be isolated. Uh, isolation is not a natural human thing. We're social beings. So you can see extremes aren't, they're not sustainable. Um, in consistent extremes. And so we get to learn that we learn best through direct experience. Mm. There's two ways to learn directly and indirectly. So we can read something and go, Oh, that's interesting. I like that. I'll, I'll do that. And we, we sort of, you know, or we don't even do it. We just think about it and we say, yeah, I know that. Or we directly learn by taking action, doing and integrating the, you know, and then it's also integrating the mental body, the emotional body, the spiritual body, the physical body, and then bringing that into the world in a cohesive way. Mm. And that's empowering as well. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And, um, yeah, it's like if you identify as someone who is always a learner, you, you'll be able to move away from, because when people go into trauma release stuff, it's kind of like the, the implicit assumption is I'm broken. And as yes. you mentioned with the paradox is that, well, you're, you're applying, therefore that you, you're searching to be healed. And um, can, you, can you ever get to that state of perfection? Um, well, I don't personally believe that you can when, you know, when you're living because we, we live in that state of perfection and what makes the mm. human experience so wonderful is that striving towards the fulfillment of our potential, you know, mm. um, which is, which is beautiful. But yeah, I love that idea of always just being a learner. Um, cause it makes you more humble as well. Hey, <laughs> yeah, man. And you know, for me, humility has been one of my life lessons. I don't feel it's a massive lesson for me right now at this phase of my life, but it has been being humble and being in humility has been a big lesson, a big teacher for me. And, and I really come back to that often. 
And one of the ways I can do that is by being willing to learn and listen to other people's opinions and their experiences and their vantage point. That doesn't mean I disregard my own. I don't lose myself in someone else's idea of how the world should be, mm. but I'm willing to listen and I'm more open to, to hearing that. And I'm more open to disagreeing or offering a, another perspective from a healthier place as opposed to before I would be aggressive. I would be defensive. I would attack. I'd be, I'd yell, I'd scream. My tone would be, would be sharp. I would be angry. I, it could even go to physical violence, you know, to defend my vantage point. Extremes. We live mm. in a society where that's not really necessary the vast majority of the time, but I yeah. was coming from internal wounding and pain and fear and that's what's going to happen. Of course. And have you seen, so with your work with, with men, have you seen that um, aggression is, seems to be kind of like an archetypal coping strategy? Is that more prevalent with yeah. men? Yeah, yeah. Part of that is our, so there's a number of reasons for that. There's cultural reasons for that. There's biological reasons for of that. Course, of hormonal course. reasons for that. Uh, there's historical reasons for that as well, like a conditioning. There's, there's the way we bring up each uh, bring up our families as a, va a societal values thing. But to answer your question directly, yes, aggression tends to be the go-to strategy to deal with conflict or difficulty in men. Yes, yeah, and um, you know you'd be lying as well. I started doing jujitsu about eight months ago, and you'd be lying yeah. to yourself as a man um, if you said it doesn't feel good. Now, like in context. Yeah. You know, we're not going to take that out of context, but like it does, it makes you, it gives you a sense of um, empowerment. Empowerment. It does, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Mm. No, I hear you, man. I've been, I've been involved in, in martial arts or striking sports for many, many years and, and it's been a, it feels fucking great. Yeah. It does. And it's, hormonally we're, we're different. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that because we've got more testosterone or because we've got a, a variant hormonal profile that, we're excused and we're allowed to be aggressive. It's not about that. However, there's just a, sometimes it feels natural to be, to physically exert. And we've been conditioned that way over millions of years as well. Men have um, to, to physically exert our aggression. Now in, in our society and because of our elevation of consciousness and you know, the development of language and our prefrontal cortex and our ability to reason, and analyze and be creative and understand the world in a very different place, we get to express our aggression in healthier ways. I just started jiu-jitsu a couple of months ago as well, and I love it. Yeah. Coming from boxing and sort of kickboxing and Muay Thai, and that, it's really challenging for me, but it's, it's, it's very, it feels very empowering as well, you know? And the, the, it feels like there's, a, there's a, a nice combination of masculine, feminine, expressive energy in jiu-jitsu as well, which is cool. And mm. I, get to, I get to go be very direct and rigid if I need to, and I get to be more fluid if I need to as well. So it's a good practice for me personally to, to step more into um, a balanced expression of my of my of myself. Yes, absolutely. and I still I still love the striking sports too. I mean, I still I still box. Um, I, I I love that. I appreciate that. I get a lot from that. It, 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 I just love that as well. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, definitely. And yeah, you you move to a place where you know you you um start rolling with like a brown belt or a black belt, and they're almost just they're just in this complete <laughs> meditation flow. They're waiting for you to yeah. fuck up. And then yeah. when you do, they strike, you know, but obviously yeah. as white belts, it's kind of like you just go on ham and then lose them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which is good fun, but it's crazy. Yeah. It's growth too, right? It's, yes. it's, 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 you know, the masculine, masculine archetype, part of its, its definition or part of its um, recognition is to, is challenge. And so we grow through challenge. And so if your core essence is masculine, you're going to grow through challenge. So do whatever challenges you. A healthy challenge, of course, you know. Mm. Um, you know, I wouldn't say um, don't do anything high, high risk. That's immature and extreme. Again, that's an immature, shadow masculine behavior. Um, however, challenge yourself because challenge is the realm and the domain of the masculine. Whether you're a man or a woman, it's irrelevant. Whatever expressive energy you're in, um, and if your core essence is masculine, because masculine feminine expression is not tied to gender, there is an association with gender, absolutely. That's another conversation. However, if your core essence is masculine in all these different areas of life, whether it's focus and goal orientation, whether it's your emotional body, physical body, spiritual, psychological, um, whether it's your life's purpose, if your core essence is masculine, then do be challenged regularly because that's going to help you grow and help give you insight and reflection onto who you truly are. Yes. And I'd love for you to talk on that, mate, because I was um, consuming a lot of your content around this and, you know, 
it's I think it's important um, to to find the distinction between the two because when I, for, in my own experience, um, when you're talking about masculinity and femininity and kind of how the two manifest themselves, there's like an mm. intuitive knowing um as mm, to which mm, one mm. you know resonates with you the most so if you mm, could just speak mm. around the difference between the two to be a bit great yeah yeah so I, I don't as you know, i say something interesting here i don't know whether we're born with a core essence or whether it's developed very early on in the minutiae of our experience in the outside world maybe even in the womb per se and so we do find that there is a, a natural gravitation that most females will carry a core essence of femininity and most males will carry a f- core essence of masculinity, but that's not necessarily the case either, you know? So it's not explicitly tied to gender yeah. um, or male, female, but you know, there's, there's so many different characteristics that outline masculinity and femininity, some core drivers. So the masculine has a masculine core essence has this yearning to be empty and to be free to be not burdened by um, attachment or even worldly things is this emptiness. So if, if the masculine has too many things on, I'll use the, the term he, he would want to be free of that. He wants to empty himself. Whereas the feminine is engulfed and driven by love and intimacy, relationship to herself, to things, to intimate romantic relationship as well. That's a core essence of the feminine drive. Um, the feminine drive wants to be full and blissful and elated, whereas a man is very physical and very rigid and structured and driven and direct in his energetic expression, or the masculine is, yeah? Um, whereas the female is more fluid. And so the, the way I describe um, masculinity and femininity is, and, and I got part of this from Michaela Bohm, who's amazing, by the way. She did a lot of work with David Data and then branched off 18 years later. Um, but there's the masculine energy has a be, a do, and what I call an exclusive energy. And the feminine energy has a, a, um, a sorry, the masculine energy is a do, a go, and an exclusive energy. And the feminine energy is more of a, a be, flow, and inclusive energy. And so you can look at, uh, agreeableness and inclusivity being that feminine driver community driven where masculine presence will be more content being in solitude being at one with self you know connected maybe to the cosmos where the feminine chorus is very connected to earth as well and so that again doesn't mean we can't have a combination of, of masculine feminine energetics running through us it's you know what are that what is our core core essence there are some distinctions there are plenty more yes yeah, geez, just, even just as you're talking, I'm obviously relating that to my own life. And um, when you're talking about masculinity, I'm always like in the work I'm doing, I can't, I, it's almost like I feel like I can't wait to get to this place where mm. it, it's, it's done and I'm fulfilled myself. <laughs> but then the, then the irony is I've been in that place sometimes, like even just at school, like I'll finish my exams or something. Then after three days, I'm going nuts. So I want to be back in the mm. ship. <laughs> mm. Yeah, where single, your masculine, masculine essence is very single task orientated as well. So it's very focused, very driven for that, for that moment. But it's also driven by vision. It's also driven by mission as well. Whereas the feminine mission is more in intimacy and love, giving and receiving love, um, and really being present to that. You know, the masculine core energy is a giving energy. Feminine core energy is a receiving energy as well. I mean, that's, that's also that's part of that dynamic as well. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's, it's so helpful to, to know this stuff because it's, there's so much information out there in the world about how different people live their lives and what you could do. And it almost sounds to me like, especially with how you, you put it, once you, you have this intuitive awareness of, of what you resonate with, leaning into that makes you feel very, it gives you a lot of clarity. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. If it feels right for you, because we wear these masks. So we wear, mm. I did a video on this yesterday about the masks that we wear around masculinity and femininity specific. To, so we wear many different masks to protect ourselves and keep ourselves safe, psychological, emotional masks. However, specifically to masculinity and femininity, we, we can go through these stages depending on what we're exposed to in our environment that really keep us away from our core essence. And we just become confused and we, we depolarize attraction because attraction in 
relationship, sexual polarity and intimate polarity, relational polarity is determined by positive pole and a negative pole coming together. Mm. Um, and if you've got two negatives or two positive poles, they're just, they're just going to bounce off each other. They're not going to magnetize. And so if you, if we're wearing lots of many masks and we depolarize it because we don't know ourselves, we're just repelling people or we're attracting the quote unquote wrong type of people. And that's not healthy either. Yep. Yep. And I mean, even just very simply, like I do not want to bang myself. <laughs> Correct. I'm you not, don't, you don't want, you're a heterosexual man. You don't want to have sex with another man. You yeah. don't want to have sex with another masculine energy core. Right? Yes. You can see. That, and so though. you're going to be looking for that feminine pole. Yeah. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So how much of this comes into the work you do with fellas that centering around the, the masculine yeah, a, a great deal, a great deal of it. It's helping really helping men understand themselves and stepping into their core essence of, of masculinity. You know, often people say, oh, I want to make my man more feminine or I want him to be more compassionate and emotional and, and connect with me and understand me and tap to, and touch me. How do I make him step into his feminine more? And men will come to me and say, I want to tap into my feminine more. And, after deliberation and, and going into that a conversation at deeper levels and really going into, okay, what's really underpinning that question? Part of the solution for that is you, ha- you need to step more into your core essence of ma- healthy masculinity right. because that will naturally organically bring out a balance of feminine expression and relatability and understanding of the feminine because you're going to meet her in a, uh, in a polarity where you can actually be attracted to each other. And in that attraction, there's openness. And in that openness, you connect and communicate in a way that is healthy to you both. And it makes sense. Yes. Yeah, yeah. that makes a lot of sense. But if you keep stepping into your femininity, as, as say, as a man, and, and your woman, the woman in your life is in her feminine, it's not going, it's going to numb. Yes. That yeah. makes perfect sense. It's, and it's just a, the age old wisdom of the past, isn't it? It's like, you just need to yeah. be more of who you are. Yeah. Yeah, simple. Makes, makes a lot of sense. Yeah. But own, owning that can be difficult and scary oh, yes. because so much of who we are is criticised and judged in this world and we, we feel excluded. Yeah. And so absolutely. we do what includes us because it feels safer. Or yeah. part of a tribe. And I was even reading a, um, there was a study, I don't know how conclusive this is, but it was just a thing in passing where there's that big movement at the moment where... Um, men need to to cry more or feel like they can cry. Mm. I personally don't think, I mean, I think we've been writing poetry and expressing our feelings for a long time, you know, but yeah. um, apparently testosterone does something to our ability to cry and it actually just mediates the, um, the ability for us to cry more. I, I'd have to look into that, but um, I don't, I don't personally know about that. I mean, to speak from personal, it's, it's hard though. Like, I get my testosterone level. I get my, I get my bloods checked regularly. My testosterone level is on the high end of, of normal. I don't take any supplements for it. I don't take any, uh, anything artificial or synthetic. I never have. Um, there have been times in my life where I've cried a lot. Did I get my testosterone checked at those times? I don't know, but I was going through emotional turmoil. I mean, Mm. I was deliberately putting myself in fucking a lot of pain and a lot of um, exposure to express and release. So, Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if there's a direct correlation with that. I, I don't think men need to cry more. I just think we have to access the fullness of our emotions on the spectrum mm-hmm. of emotions when relative and not suppress. I don't think any human being should suppress emotions. So granted it's safe. Like if you're safe to express emotions and you're numbing yourself because of past patterns or conceptions that are misleading, that's not healthy because you're numbing yourself. Yes. I don't think men should walk around in tears all the time. I don't think they should walk <laughs> around being highly emotion, emotionally sensitive and, and meek and weak and crying at the drop of the hat. I don't think that's, that's masculine per se. Right. I do think men need to, or masculinity needs to be able to access emotions as well. And when doing so, it's probably slipstream more into a feminine energetic within a man's self. Doesn't mean he mm. can't do that in a very safe environment. Doesn't mean he can't be vulnerable. Um, we need that, but it's how we do that that's very important. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, mate, that, I have learned a lot from that. That was really good. That was really, I really appreciated that. Um, what are you doing now? So you're in Sydney travelling at the moment. I'm in Sydney travelling. Uh, I've, been, I've been in Australia since the uh, 4th of, de- 5th of December, uh, oh. Melbourne, Perth, so family and friends. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm leaving on Wednesday. So I'm back, to, I'm back home in the US on Wednesday, which I'm very excited about. A lot of great things happening there. Um, yeah. Yeah. What's up for 2020? Oh man. Um, a lot of programs, uh, that are being released, uh, working with women. My, my wife and I have a program, um, for women, for single ladies wanting to call in their king. 
um, called Be the Queen. So we just we're just finishing a round of that now. Like 60, 60 ladies just in this epically deep container for three months. We start again around April, I think April May, but more than likely April. Um, and that's exciting. That's really yeah. exciting as well. Um, I've got a I've got an amazing program called Be the King that I'll be launching next year. Uh, sorry, this year towards the end of the year as well. It's it's uh, I've got other programs called the Conscious Man and Reclaim Your Kingdom, and this is an evolution of that. And so they're still going as well in their own respects. I'm doing a lot of deep work with an organisation called Sacred Sons. So we are a, there's five of us that are a part of this core group, and we just we're going deep, really providing a lot of healing in the world for men. And I'm very excited about that, mm. and just just some other ventures as well that I've got going on this this year. You know, my my wife and I are running a, an amazing retreat in September in Austin, Texas. Um, that's going to be epic, a three and a half, four day retreat, immersive. It's going to be breath work, self work, um, a lot of reflective stuff, getting rid of the old, bringing in the new and, and really providing people, individuals, it's open to men and women and couples, providing tools for deep, sincere, sustainable transformation. Wow. That's mate, that, that's awesome. There's so much cool stuff going on in Austin. It yeah. seems to be the place. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It is a cool place, man. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'll and be living. We'll be living there. So we'll be living there March. Yeah. Oh we'll right. House there. Yeah, oh yeah, shit, yeah. mate. Well, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Thanks. How good. I have to come visit. Yeah. Uninvited. Yeah, absolutely, uninvited. brother. <laughs> you're invited. Absolutely. Oh, you're a good man. Thank you, sir. <laughs> um, you're welcome. And and where can people find you? Stephanosafandos.com is my website. My um, Instagram handle, Facebook, LinkedIn, all of that. YouTube. Stephanosafandos. Beautiful. Yeah. Mate, thanks so much for doing the show. I, like I said, I, I really Thank did you, want brother. to do this. Um, for, for a while, um, with especially with the stuff you, you, you're putting out and following the YouTube channel for a long time. And um, it's good. And I, I'm really keen to do more, as the, especially towards the end of the year when, you, when all this stuff is yeah. coming to fruition. It would be awesome to hear yeah. about. Yeah, definitely, man. I appreciate you in the world. Thank you for everything you're doing. Thank you for the interview. And um, yeah, just let me know when this is released and I'll definitely distribute through my network as well. Beautiful. Awesome. Thanks, Absolutely. mate. Absolutely. Thank you, we'll brother. talk soon. Many blessings. Speak soon. All right, guys. There it was. The episode with my dear friend, Steph, we're definitely going to get him back on the show. Um, we'll just kind of rotate him through, I think, as the years go by because he's, you know, as you listen to the show, you, you kind of get a sense that there's a lot more to him and we've got a whole lot more information and wisdom there um, that we really can bang out in, a, in an hour-long episode. So that's going to be really exciting. And if you want to follow him along, guys, like he said um, at the end of the show there, Stephanos, Stephanos, all the major channels, um, his bio is written up in the show notes. You can follow him on Instagram and LinkedIn. I follow him on Instagram, and that's really powerful too. So stay tuned there, guys. Uh, I love you all, and I will speak to you next week.